This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I've got a special treat for all of you. I will be talking to Catherine Moffat. You all remember her as the pretty blonde in The Beast Within, celebrating its 40th anniversary. Yeah, cult classic. She'll be my second guest from that. I talked to Philippe Mora, Philippe Mora a few years ago, and um, she's been in a lot of good stuff. She was in a, uh, a sex comedy movie called Racket back in 79. She guest starred on every show like Night Court, BJ and the Bear, Knight Rider, Chips, Starman, Star Trek Next Generation, Freddy's Nightmares. She did uh, voices for the Fantastic Four and Iron Man cartoons in the 90s. So much great stuff. And then she got out of the business, and we're going to find out why today. And it's going to be a great conversation. I don't want to be a Debbie Downer, but I'm not going to lie. This was a shitty weekend for me. One of my really good friends is in critical condition following stupidity that happened as he was visiting the Bay Area. And I'm really depressed about that. And my mom took yet another fall this weekend, but she's okay. Just another damn surgery. And I'm trying to remain positive and just wait. That's all I can do is wait and remain positive. So yeah, here is my interview with Catherine Moffat. Hey, Catherine, welcome to the show. How are you today? Hi, Tommy. I'm good. How are you? I am just spectacular. This is such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Oh, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. It's always fun to talk about uh, my favorite times. And so I'm glad that we get to do this. Awesome. So, yeah, go- thank you for inviting me. My pleasure. Yeah. So, going back in time, did you gravitate toward acting early on in your childhood? I think I was born acting. I was. <laughs> I came out of the womb. I acted just like a baby. People believed me. It was great. Um, <laughs> no, I just, you know, I was one of those little kids that uh, played dress up and always, you know, wanted to pretend to be this person or that, but Actually, no, I never intended on being an actor. Uh, it kind of happened by accident. I mean, I enjoyed it, and it was fun, but uh, I never dreamed that I would have a career in acting. That was not really what I thought of. In fact, I grew up in a very strict household, and we didn't even own a TV set. Wow. So uh, I grew up having no idea who the popular TV stars were or anything like that or... So it was, uh, you know, I was starring in television before my family even owned one. <laughs> you didn't? So, you mean you didn't? A little different. You mean you didn't even watch TV at friends' houses? Yeah, I used to babysit so that I could watch TV. Oh. <laughs> so, and, the, and my father always seemed to knew, know if there was something scary or inappropriate on, and he'd show up he, to keep me company while I babysat so that I wouldn't watch something that was not appropriate for my tender young ears. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, now I, I became a professional actor quite by accident. I always wanted to be a designer. And mm-hmm. I think designing is probably my natural calling. And actually that's what I'm doing today. And I love it. And for me, it's, it's like breathing. It comes completely naturally. Um, I had designed the costumes for a high school play. Uh, we had done the drunkards um, and uh, Moyer. Mm-hmm. And I designed the costumes, and one of the cast members got sick at the last moment, and I was the only one who basically knew how to make the dress fit. And I had been to the rehearsal, so I knew it. And, uh, you know, typical Hollywood story, uh, one of the cast member's mother was a famous TV star and she brought her agent to see her daughter and he saw me and said hey kid I'll make you a star and and he did (laughs) 
I became a contract player at Universal Studios shortly after that, and wow. one thing led to another, led to another, and 30 years as a working actor, um, that's what I became. And then when I retired, I went back to Plan A, which was to be a designer, and that's where I am now. Did, 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 you, did you study with any um, act, acting teachers out in L.A.? Oh, I did. I absolutely did. I spent a lot of time. I studied with a number of different teachers, but the teacher I spent the most time with was Harry Master George, um, mm -hmm. who was uh, out of the American Academy in New York. And uh, he was quite the taskmaster, master, but uh, my... Um, scene partner for years was Ray Liotta, oh. who is the sweetest, sweetest man in the world. Uh, so, so kind and so uh, devoted. And uh, uh, we worked together for a long time. And um, he demanded, um, Harry demanded a lot of discipline and a lot of hard work and a lot of homework. And mm -hmm. You know, you had to have your work done before you ever set foot on a step or on a set, and um, um, and it paid off. It paid off. Um, so yeah, it was kind of how it happened. I enjoyed it. I mean, I loved being on a set. I loved my career. I, I you know, don't get me wrong. Uh, I just always thought that it was impossible, so I never even allowed myself to fantasize about being able to do that. Mm -hmm. Any other uh, people in your class that went on to become successful? Um, in, well, you know, doctors, lawyers, and Indian chiefs, but uh, <laughs> not, I mean, not as uh, Dave Ramsey, the football player, was in my class. Um, uh -huh. As actors, I think I was it, pretty much. Um, it was kind of funny when I went to my high school reunion. I was the one voted least changed. Really? And yet, <laughs> I changed an awful lot, but because they were watching me on TV every week, <laughs> they didn't notice the change. They kind of, they didn't have those decades of absence in order to, uh, you know, n just not see the change happen, so. Yeah, like so that. it was just you and Ray yeah. Liotta. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they got used to seeing me change, so they didn't notice it. And, uh, yeah. According to, I, um... I, I, I mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I, I see the change. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, according to IMDb, you made your TV debut on The Hardy Boys? No, actually, before that, on, um... Because my TV debut was, what was it called, Oregon Trails. Okay. Uh, with Andrew Stevens and Rod Taylor. And it was my first interview as a contract player. It, actually, I didn't even have a contract yet at Universal Studios, and I was sent on the audition as a way of gaining experience. And I went, um, they were still figuring out things, and I went on the interview, and I, I came back to... Monique James, who was head of the contract program, and I said, they, they said, I have to go to wardrobe. And she called up the producer and said, don't tease her. She's brand new. She doesn't know what she's doing. And, and she's like, oh, really? Oh, okay. <laughs> and so we went off to Flagstaff, Arizona, and I filmed uh, The Oregon Trails, and that was my TV debut. And it was a guest star role, so I never did uh, the one-liners or the, you know, walk-ons or anything like that. I started out as a guest star. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, it is pretty cool. But then you did do, yeah. but then you did do the Hardy Boys. That Sean Cassidy was on there and Parker Stevenson. Oh, yeah. Parker Stevenson, yeah, that was fun. Um, yeah, I think I was a stewardess or something on that show. They dyed my hair brown. Yeah, it's, it's on your IMDb. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was a natural blonde, and they had another actress who had blonde hair. They didn't want two blondes, so they dyed mine brown. And I think we 
crashed our airplane in the ocean or the rain or something. And mm-hmm. I, I don't remember a whole lot about that show except that I was very upset that the stuff they put on my hair was washing out and going all over my clothes. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you could see it on TV, but it was pretty messy. <laughs> oh, that's pretty awful. Yeah. Yeah, these are the things you don't know when you're watching. But when you're on the set, it's like, oh, no, our actress is running. <laughs> <laughs> you did a couple episodes yeah. of, B- of BJ and the Bear. How was that? Uh, Greg again. what a lovely guy. What a lovely guy. Um uh, it was fun. It was, it was, I have to say, I enjoyed my career. I, I uh, very few shows that I'd not have a good time on. Um, in fact, I'd be hard pressed to name one. Working with the chimpanzee was a little difficult at times because um, uh, they're not always interested in what you want them to do. Uh, we did have trainers, and it was two chimpanzees. There was. Uh, I remember one of them's name was Oopsie, and one of them, one of them was smart but not very cute, and the other one was very cute and not very smart. And so when you saw the face, it was the cute, not real smart one. And when you saw them doing something smart, you didn't see the face. That was the smart, not very cute one. If that makes sense at all. Mm-hmm. That does make sense. And yeah, that was one of my first times working with a animal that was other than you know a domestic type animal but it was a wonderful experience and thoroughly enjoyed it yeah those shows were pretty you know common back in the day with having uh, monkeys on on tv shows you know but now it's like you know with the uh, animal endangerment laws and all that stuff it's like right. you, you can't get that right. done today yeah i i you know i, I grew up that the, mm-hmm. the chimpanzees they had a bigger trailer than i did yeah. They had their own staff. They had, you know, their, uh, they were cushy, I tell you. <laughs> they, they, they were very well taken care of and treated very, very well. And I spent time talking with their trainers about how they were trained, and it was very kind the way they were trained. And they seemed to enjoy doing what they were doing and had a really good time and they were given lots and lots of rest breaks so you know on behalf of the animals um because i am an animal lover and would not tolerate uh, an animal being abused or taken advantage of in any way shape or form oh yeah and i did not see anything that i would object to of how those particular chimps now i'm sure that there are situations where animals on sets are not treated well but in that particular situation, um, I think they were treated very well. I, I grew up watching reruns of Lancelot, Link, Secret Chimp, and God, it's amazing how they were able to get all those monkeys to dress like humans and act like them on that show. I, I'm sure there's, there, there had to have been some kind of abuse or something behind the scenes, but mm. but it was amazing how they know. pulled it off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I did a show uh, called what was it called? Peaceable Kingdom with Lindsay Wagner? Mm-hmm. Does that sound right? Yeah. And we, we did a scene where, I think I was a zookeeper or something, and uh, we had a, a baby elephant or a young elephant. Now, mind you, a young elephant is still enormous, and it was like the size of a Volkswagen. And uh, the elephant was trained to go stand on one of those cement garden stepping stone things mm-hmm. that was his mark well Lindsay's taller than me and so I had what's called an apple box which is just a box that you stand on it, the viewer never sees it but it makes me appear taller so that you could see me over the elephant mm-hmm. and uh, so the scene was to take place with Lindsay and I having a conversation over the back of the elephant while we were brushing the elephant and this was a young elephant and he was playful and having fun well he decided he liked my apple box better than he liked his little garden stone <laughs> so he came walking in and he stood up on my apple box and there was just which of course meant i was completely invisible uh-huh. <laughs> and so you know the answer was to give me a taller apple box well pretty soon this whole thing is up in the air 
<laughs> the elephant was just having a wonderful time. So uh, I don't even remember what the ultimate solution was, but that elephant had his own ideas about how we would film it. So I'm sure it was pretty much on the set. You know what the director says goes. That's it. You do what he says. But when you have animals. They don't really care. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they kind of have their own thing. I mean, they're beautifully behaved. But once in a while, they have their own ideas, and you just have to work with that. Mm hmm. Absolutely. Then you do with uh, the raunchy comedy Racket. I love that movie. <laughs> oh, goodness. Goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was a long time ago. We filmed that one at this wonderful old mansion on Sunset Boulevard that is now gone. Wow. And that mansion uh, caused quite a controversy is that it had um, statues uh, all around the front of it and uh, anatomically correct, as they say. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the latest owner went and had them all painted in appropriate colors, which upset the neighbors terribly. <laughs> but it was an interesting uh, mansion in that it was built during Prohibition. And uh, when you walked in, there was an enormous foyer and a huge part of the floor would slide back and expose a very grand staircase that went underneath to a hidden, um, uh, what would you call it, like a, a a bar room with a dance floor and there were secret tunnels. Oh, a discotheque. Right. Yeah. Burke Hobby was in that one. What was his movie? Yeah. It was it was fun. It was it was a interesting one of the things about doing what I did was mm. we got to go to some really fascinating locations and see some very interesting places. A couple of years ago, I talked to Linda Day George, and I forgot to bring this movie up. I was going through a dark time at the time, and I just it just completely slipped my mind. How was working with her? Oh, she's charming, absolutely charming. Yeah. Um, yeah, a total pro, a total pro. You know, those are the ones. You know, when they're around for a while, uh, you know, when a career has a longevity. Uh, they're pros. They're pros. Yeah. Get in, get that job done, be nice. Um, you you, you want to be, you want to work professionally and be good with people on the set. Uh, and, and she was absolutely lovely. Absolutely lovely. I, I haven't heard too many good things about Tanya Roberts, but was this one of those rare times she was nice? never had a problem with her. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things to cut her some slack mm -hmm. um, it is tough on a set. Yeah. And it's tough. Um, you get pushed around a lot sometimes. And mm -hmm. uh, the demands placed on you, especially when you're beautiful like she is. Yeah. Every little thing is criticized, everything. And you're supposed to be perfect all the time. And uh, and that can be rather difficult. And I know that on certain shows I had my moments where I could get kind of difficult. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, you're still people. You're still people. And you're at work, especially women are always in the makeup chair first, which means we're there at 6 a.m. at least, if not earlier. And, and then you're working at very, very, very long hours. And it's not always comfortable. It's um, you're freezing or you're hot or you're... Um, hungry <laughs> especially if you're running around in a bikini as Tanya did frequently you're hungry and um, and it, it, it's not you know people think it's just it's an easy job it's not yeah and sometimes it gets to you 
And unfortunately, you could be lovely a hundred times and get pissed off and go crazy once, and that's what people remember. Yeah. Or that's what they talk about. They're looking for problems because, gosh, she's a nice gal, does not sell newspapers. Yeah. So, you know, I give her credit. I, I give her credit. I never had a problem with her. She was always good to me. Uh, she's good. a pro. That's uh, good. About business, and she didn't take crap from anyone, and she was given a lot of crap. So, yeah, she's a Brooklyn girl. Yeah, yeah, that, that was part of it, you know? She yeah. had that no-nonsense attitude. And uh, some people, you know, they look at a pretty woman, they expect her to be a cupcake. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> just because you're pretty doesn't mean you're stupid. And there was a time during that particular era of TV where, honestly, I would open my mouth and people would say, oh my gosh, you're much smarter than I thought you'd be. <laughs> Excuse me? I'm blonde and that somehow makes me an idiot. Of course, I played idiots a lot, but that's because, yeah. you know, <laughs> that's how I made my living. <laughs> I've, I've talked to a lot of pretty women who are smart, you know, there's... There's, there's, it's just a dumb stereotype, yeah. you know. Well, it, it's a stereotype, and it's it's something that a lot of actors as well have to play against that. Um, that David Hasselhoff, for example, is one of the most brilliant businessmen I've ever met. Mm -hmm. Absolutely brilliant businessman. And... Um, <laughs> He's, he's, he's pretty something, but I know he takes a lot of grief because he's a pretty man. Yeah. Rocket yeah. Rocket has a really great cast, though. Oh, my God. Edie Adams, her son Josh yeah. has a uh, podcast where he interviews the uh, children of famous people, both dead or alive. He, he, he interviews dead people? He interviews the, 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 the relatives of dead people, both dead and alive of famous people. Yeah. I'm teasing you. <laughs> I'm teasing you. I know. Uh, yes, of course. Yeah. Um, that's great. Yeah, I would imagine being the, the... I have friends who are children of famous people, and they have some interesting stories to tell about uh, what that's like, and the expectations that's placed on them is frequently makes their lives rather difficult. And I am very grateful. I come from nowhere. <laughs> I, I was invisible. How was uh, working with Phil Silvers in that? He was funny. He just was always on. Always, always just funny. Mm -hmm. um, he was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. I was, I was brand new when I did that movie. And I did not know uh, you know, much of anything. Um, he he was a lot of fun. That was, I mean, this was in the seventies. Yeah. Um, but uh, um, I was I was reading this movie went through a shitload of rewrites, and it wasn't as body as it ended up being. Yeah, yeah. The original script and what finally made the screen was was different. But you know what? That always happens. Yeah. Every time they do a rewrite on a, a script, the uh, pages change color. And uh, it starts out white, and then they add pink and blue, and I forget the order, yellow, green, whatever. And it goes on and on and on. And by the time a, a script is finally done, it's like a rainbow. And uh, there'd be very few white pages left. And the same mm -hmm. is true in television. They just, they write, they write, they write, they write. And The Beast Within is one that was practically rewritten after it was filmed. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, the, it's, it's part of the creative process. That, uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Bur I, I know Burke Convy... Yeah, I know that Burke Convy was a little disappointed about it and stuff. Funny thing is, you know, he was on he hosted Tattletales and I saw your episode on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's true with my husband Jimmy Moffat. Yeah, JB uh, Farr was on there. Yeah. 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 
that was, I don't really remember that that well. I just remember that I was there with Jimmy Moffat. Um, uh, and the, <laughs> anyway, yeah, that was that was something. And Jamie Farr, of course, is just a hoot. Um, yeah, too bad you didn't get to be on there with Mitzi and Charlie. God, they were hilarious on there. I love Mitzi and Charlie. Yeah. yeah. T- t- yeah. Two of my favorite guests my, I've ever yeah, had. How's Mitzi? And he always says, she's short. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were doing they were doing their shtick the whole time on here and I was just Always. I was loving it. Oh my god, they are so funny. Yeah, yeah. They're they're great. Yeah. 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 So how do you get cast in the, the Beast Within? How did I get cast? I I mm-hmm. agent called to go on in and I went in went through the regular audition process. And um, uh, I didn't meet Paul until I was actually on the set. Yeah. He let us meet each other. And uh, uh, we went to Jackson, Mississippi. Mm. And uh, we all stayed in this little, I mean, there was nothing there at the time. And so we stayed in this little kind of roadside hotel uh, with one restaurant, and um, actually it was really fun. You know, when you go on location for an extended period of time, your your cast and crew becomes your entire world, and uh, you get real close. And um, it's like a whole different world, and when you're not shooting, it's like whoever has a car, you go off and you explore the area. And... Um, it was my first time spending any period of time in the South. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, was, it was good. I was uh, fairly and newlywed at the time, and my husband came down a couple times. And uh, it was a good group, a good group. We were a very cohesive group. Philippe Mora, our director, was... I know Philip. yeah. He was great. Have you interviewed him? I, I talked to him in 2019. He's a force of nature, that guy. <laughs> and he filmed it. He yeah. and Sam got married on that shoot. Oh. His wife. His current wife. Yeah. Current, I don't know if he's the only wife. But they got married on that shoot, so they were a couple of lovebirds. And uh, he, his eyes would like, you think I'm describing what he was. It was like his eyes would be on fire. He just was like so excited and so he said that the, had such wonderful visions. And uh, it was very exciting to film that because all of the special effects, they were all from uh, people from altered states. It was all brand new. The, the use of the air bladders and the use of a lot of those things were all brand new technology. Now it's all 40 years old and old hat, but at the time it was cutting edge stuff. And uh, um, um, the unfortunate thing that happened to that movie was that it got caught up in a studio sale. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, the, the new regime, it wasn't their film, so they wanted it finished, done, and out of there. And so they pretty much pulled the plug on us before we really had the opportunity to film everything we needed to film, including a lot of story that would explain stuff and a lot of the special effects that we had planned. And uh, and so it really didn't have the opportunity to become the film we had hoped it would be. Um, I still like it. <laughs> and that you know, how, how Hollywood worked. It, uh, they, they want to promote their own new stuff. And um, yeah. When, yeah, when MGM was sold to UA, UA kind of threw us under the bus. And I can say that now that I'm not in Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that is the truth of it. That's what happened. And uh, it is still a fabulous, fun movie. It is. Um, I love how it opens. Oh, how it opened? Yeah, with BB. Yeah. 
<laughs> with the yeah. the grinding of the hamburger meat. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right, that's right, yeah. Yeah, Philippe is all, I have a dark sense of humor. <laughs> oh, he does, he does. Well, pretty much everybody on that show had a dark sense of humor. We, you, so much laughter, it's like more blood and guts. So yeah. much laughter, and... Uh, Yeah, there's three towns, Bolton, Jackson, and Raymond. Because it was Raymond. Mm-hmm. Now, is Raymond where the Grand Old Opry is? I thought the Grand Old Opry was in Nashville. Listen. I could be wrong, I don't know. Oh, it's the Raymond, Raymond Auditorium in the Grand Old Opry, okay. Yeah, and it was in Raymond, which is basically, was a, a spot on the map, just a spot. And, uh... Swamps were scary at night. Yeah. They're spooky. And even in winter, they've got some serious critters going on down there. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, you can go anywhere. You can go anywhere by yourself. And, uh, yeah. And about three layers of long underwear cut into various shapes to fit underneath your clothes is cold. Mm-hmm. I never thought of it as getting cold, but yeah. 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 Oh, there's some great character actors in this movie, including L.Q. Jones, who just passed away. Yeah, yeah. He he was great. He was, they were all great. They were all great. Ernest Borgnine. Um, yeah, yeah. It was. I I think it was a film work. Everybody kind of got a chance to really stretch and really do their thing. And uh, Philippe just encouraged us to be creative with what we were doing. And um, gosh, it was a pleasure. A lot of fun. A lot of fun, that movie. And, and Paul Clemens was perfect for the role because he has that that already offbeat look to him, you know, with the dimple in the chin. Just, I think that, I don't think anybody else could have played that role like he did, you know. I mean, no. even in that scene no. where he's got those big old cysts popping <laughs> out of his face, you know, I don't, no. I don't think that would look good on anybody no. else, not even Michael J. Fox. <laughs> no, no. He, he was, he was so into that character. It, mm. it was remarkable, the energy that he put into the character and the devotion to it. And, 
Uh, he stayed very much in character throughout the entire time we were there, which takes a lot of energy. And so kudos to him. He, he, he did an excellent job and really, really um, gave his thousand percent to that. Uh, it was remarkable, absolutely remarkable. And that was, you know, quite a metamorphosis of a character for him. Oh, yeah. Go so from this sweet, charming teenager to this crazy beast creature. Yeah, what were the hardest scenes to film? Because every, well, every horror movie has hard scenes to film. <laughs> well, tromping around on the swamp, that was, that was, uh, that was tough. The one that I, I, I had a hard time, I don't know why I had a hard time with it. It was one where a dog comes and drops like a hand in my face or something. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then I screamed like crazy. Um, but that was about it. Well, yeah, there was one of the things happened... There was one mishap on the set that was kind of weird, and it wasn't hard for me. It was actually the easiest scene I ever filmed, and it was the one where Paul is lurking around my room, and I'm asleep, and um, you don't really see my whole face, and the reason you don't is because half of my face was very swollen. Mm -hmm. Um, We'd been out in the swamp, and apparently I was allergic to something, and I had a horrific allergic reaction and they gave me antihistamine and uh, I was passed out. <laughs> <laughs> so I really was asleep. <laughs> was, yeah, so I was working in my sleep. Very easy for me, that, that particular scene. Um, you know, you got to do what you got to do, but yeah, sometimes allergic things happen or, you know, people get, have things happen on set. Um, where you can, you can get hurt on the set. I mean, I wasn't hurt. I was just had an allergic reaction that looked a little... I looked like beast in that, that particular shot. <laughs> and they filmed around it, and it worked fine. It sure did. How was uh, guest starring on Chips? Well, that was... It was one of those shows where you just had to be a pro. Yeah. And um, I did my job the best of my ability, and I cashed the check and went on to the next one. I, I, t- I talked to Robert Romanus a few years ago. He's a great guy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He, he w- There's some wonderful actors on that show. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Uh there are some wonderful, wonderful actors on that show. And unfortunately, there were actors that were put in very, very difficult positions oh, yeah. on that show. And uh, and crew members that were put in very difficult positions on that show. And, and unfortunately, that happens. Um, you know, we were talking about Tanya Roberts and, you know, the reputation that uh, mm-hmm. she seems to have garnered, it, which is kind of unfair. But there are people who have reputations that they have earned. And... Um, yeah. And uh, you know, I'm not going to throw. Uh, I know. Uh, I know who you're uh, talking about. I know. <laughs> it comes up quite I, frequently. I'm not even, uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not going to go there because it's that's not my place. But there are sometimes there are actors who are very difficult to work with, and yep. you just do your job and you be a pro, and they get to be who they are, and. Um, but what happens is, after a while, if you misbehave, um, all shows end. Everyone in Hollywood is eventually unemployed. Yep. And you have to go through seeking employment again. And what happens is, um, there might be a new actor coming along. And, you know, an actor might have a big name. But if they have a big, nasty reputation, the next producers get to choose. Do we want to deal with this guy who maybe doesn't have a big name, but is a joy to work with and can develop a big name? Or do we want to deal with a big name who is a fucking pain in the ass? <laughs> you did say I can swear, so. Fuck I, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, 
and and so that particular you know actors who have done they've done it to themselves and they create a reputation that ends up sinking their own careers so um you know it, yeah it, that's pretty much all i can say about that show uh, you mentioned before working with Hasselhoff on uh, Knight Rider, so that was a lot of fun. Oh, God, he is a hoot. He is a hoot. So much fun. He's a big, giant kid and uh, a lot of fun and uh, smarter than anybody ever gave him credit for. A um, lot of fun. So tall. Um, at that time, I was about 5'8", so it's not like I'm short. And they had me in heels, but I still had to stand on an apple box any number of times so that we would both be in frame. Um, a lot of fun. That show was a pure joy, and David just... <laughs> <laughs> what a fun guy. And he he was one that really uh, made a point of making sure that everyone felt welcome and that the crew was well taken care of. And... Um, uh, he he was he was a wonderful ambassador. I'll put it that way mm -hmm. to everyone. And, and um, yeah, the hours were long. And yeah, every once in a while there were screw ups that were just ridiculous. But um, uh, it, it was a successful show for a lot of reasons, and he was a big part of that. You were on the uh, love boat with wow, some big names on that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, I was uh, played Fred Grandy's girlfriend on that one. Um, was during that show that um, I had a fall, and it changed my life. And it was ultimately the reason why I retired. Um, I fell down a major flight of stairs from the dressing rooms. Um, down to the shooting stage. See, other people who did the love boat got to go on these great cruises to China or the Mediterranean or wherever. And me, I got to go to the corner of, what was it, Formosa and Hollywood Boulevard. Not mm -hmm. very exciting cruise. It was all shot on the sound stage, and the dressing rooms are upstairs, and the sound stage is downstairs. And uh, I looked up when I should have looked down and went down the stairs and injured my spine, and it ultimately... Uh, left me unable to work, so I retired. But that's when I went to designing, and um, so uh, yeah, I spent the last twenty something years um, mm -hmm. doing dealing with a disability. But um, I know what it's like. Um, Hello. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you said you know what it's like. I know what it's right? like to have disabilities. Yeah, it's awful. Yeah, yeah. it changes. It changes your life. And uh, so at that time, I made the decision to leave Hollywood and everything to do with it behind me completely. And you're the second interview I've done since then. Um, I don't do autographs and I don't do interviews and you know I just left <laughs> <laughs> it was really hard to leave I mean I really loved my career and I didn't want to retire but you know I couldn't be safe on set anymore after that and uh, at that time in Hollywood people with disabilities were not seen on set they would hire physically capable actors and just stick in the wheelchair and say there you, there you go you're, you're represented and it's like really it's like taking a Caucasian person and painting their skin a different color and saying that ethnic group is represented. It's really pretty insulting, and that's how they do it very much today to this day. There's an awful lot of that going on where the actors that you see in wheelchairs on set cut, they get up and walk over to craft service, and mm, that bothers me. I don't like that. Yeah. Uh, I'm no longer in a wheelchair. I've been very, very blessed. To, uh, That's good. Had been a guinea pig at Cedar Sinai in 2009 through 2011, and have had my spine rebuilt. And uh, I walk 
and uh, I'm a little lumpy. I have a, I don't call it a limp, I call it a designer walk. Mm -hmm. I have a designer walk. <laughs> <laughs> I, I walk in a very unique way, but I do, and, um, and I do great. I do absolutely great, and uh, I have a fantastic life, and um, no complaints. Uh, that's what it took to get me back to plan A, which I'm, I love, I absolutely love. But I sure did have some wonderful adventures as an actor, and uh, I, I sometimes miss it. And people ask, "Well, would I go back and do voice?" Because I did a lot of voice work. Yeah. And um, you know, my voice is a little unusual, and so I did a lot of voice work and cartoons and animation and. Yeah, the Marvel things. stuff. Oh yeah, that was, those were great. Yeah. Scarlet Witch. Yeah. Oh, those were great and. Um, I loved doing that. That was probably my f favorite, favorite acting jobs was stick me in a dark little sound booth with the microphone and turn me loose. And it's like, <laughs> oh, the fun that comes out. Honestly, it's like being a balloon and they let go of the string and you can just fly and go anywhere. Uh, you don't have to be a human. You don't have to be anything. You could be all kind. You can be everything. And yeah. it, it's just, the animation was so fun. When we did the Marvel comics, um, we did them in a group sound stage, not individual sound stage, and there was like six or seven of us. And my stand was next to Jim Cummings, who mm -hmm. was a very well-known voice artist. Right. And he did Winnie the Pooh. And, and uh, the deal when we did the Marvel comics was, you know, with the set cast, we did all of the voices. and. Uh, but you had to do multiple voices, and uh, we did it almost like a live, uh, live theater, a radio theater almost, where if you did a, a scene with a and you played both characters, you had to be able to flip, which meant you went back and forth, which is no easy task. And um, I had to do that, and I just was having a tough time that day going back and forth. And in my headphones, I hear. Jim Cummings with Winnie the Pooh, and in my headphones I hear Winnie the Pooh say, yeah. <laughs> just fuck it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it made me laugh, and it put me at ease, and then I breezed through it. But, um, I love it. You know, unfortunately, after that, it became Hollywood, uh, you know, a celebrity just playing themselves, and it utterly decimated an entire art form and an entire class of actors that had spent lifetimes studying vocal manipulation in order to create voices that do things other than what your voice sounds like. Cameron Diaz, I think, is a wonderful actress, very, very talented, mm -hmm. and by the way, a charming and lovely person. But uh, she was one of the first ones cast as a voice actor, and she set the tone that, uh, and she does Cameron Diaz. That's it. Yeah. Um, and then they get Bruce Willis and, and the others in there, and it, it uh, has taken away work from actors that needed those jobs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those actors have families too. And uh, I really don't think Bruce Willis needed that money the way that the voice actors. That's me. I'm sorry. I'm probably going into a Hollywood politics that I should stay away from. But it's okay. I'm a little I... passionate about that. Yeah. And people have said, well, why don't you go back to voice acting? And it's like, why? Because I'm not famous. <laughs> not that I don't have the jobs, not that I don't have the skills, not that I can't do it. I'm not famous. It's all politics at this point. Which is sad that the art is being left behind in lieu of money. politics. Yeah. I, I I hate the way that our, our capitalistic society has become, especially with entertainment. And, you know, you, you, know, you mentioned you don't do the autograph shows. I'll tell you, I love going to conventions, but, you know, I don't like the bullshit of, you know, charging so much money for an autograph. It's like... It's like right. this this era of conventions is payback for all the years that actors didn't get residuals. You know, I've been invited to go to the Star Trek uh, conventions many times. Yeah. 
And I, I'm actually considering it because I'm at a point in my life now where um, financially it would be a good thing. There is an autograph of me on a Star Trek card that you can buy on eBay. And I'm very insulted. I think it's on sale now. I've, I've been put wow. on sale. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, my name isn't spelled right. And uh, which I think is hysterical because I don't do autographs. Yeah. And um, uh, so if I were to go to the Star Trek convention, at least it would be spelled correctly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I just, I am, I get very overwhelmed in large groups of people. And I, I'm, I, I'm very happy being the support cast. I'm very happy not being a star. I, I, you know, one-on-one, I'm great. But in a large group, I'm like, get me out of here. Uh, I like doing my job, and then I go home. And I, I really feel like my job is to do the very best job I am absolutely capable of in between action and cut. And then after that, um, I'm just a person <laughs> yeah <laughs> and I you know I spent years dealing with people who would track me down to my home and do some pretty frightening things and I I just I don't handle that well <laughs> <laughs> I to this day get fan mail and um I just don't know how to deal with it it's like why do these people need to know personal things about me it's none of their business Right. I don't understand. I don't get it. <laughs> I'm not that interesting. I like I drink coffee. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sitting here in my pajamas right now. You know what is interesting about that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have a cat. So what? Oh, I People do too. Like That's interesting, I guess. But I feed him. So. <laughs> I'm sure you got a lot of fans, though, from that Star Trek Next Generation episode. Yeah, you want to know something funny? Uh, mm-hmm. I did Next Generation, and then I did Deep Space Nine, and then uh, mm-hmm. did an episode there, and uh, they did a fan poll, and I was voted the favorite mm-hmm. female guest star of all on that. They liked me. I, I think it's funny that in both shows I was very evil. I was very evil. I'm in jail. I've been killed so many times. It's just incredible. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in jail. Oh, man. I, I like playing bad guys. They're fun. Um, but my brother-in-law edited one of those shows. He didn't even know it was me. Oh. I bet, I bet the makeup was. I bet the makeup was uncomfortable. Once they got it on, it, it just, it, they, the, the Westmorelands did the makeup, and oh my gosh, what incredible artists they are. Mm-hmm. Um, they did a, a, the only uncomfortable part that they really, I don't like, didn't like at all, was when they made a plaster uh, mask of my face. Mm-hmm. They make a mold of your face, and then they make these latex pieces based on that, and so they have to, like, cover up your whole face like make a cast on your face and um and your ears and everything and you just have little straws sticking out your nose for your so you can breathe and uh, i happen to be claustrophobic mm-hmm. and uh and so that that was a little a little uncomfortable for me to do that and um but the molds that they made from that cast and they stick them on your face, and they just move right with your face. So you, after a while, you don't even feel it. It's just your face. And uh, in one of them, I wore these contact lenses that had, they were orange, and um, they had like uh, horizontal uh, diamond-shaped irises. So Mm -hmm. it blocked off a lot of my vision so I could only see a very limited field 
And when you walk around on a sound stage, unless you're in the part where they're filming, it's dark. And uh, so I've got this giant wig and this giant dress, and mm-hmm. uh, and, uh, and I can't see, so I had to have somebody walk with me so I wouldn't land on my ass because I couldn't see. Yeah. I, it was. It was. Uh, I, I, that was probably the most. I've had uh, that was a fun fun show mm-hmm. you got to be directed by Corey Allen who was uh, the bad oh. guy in Rebel Without a Cause yeah he was great he was great he just, just turned us loose just turned us loose that was a fun show and then uh, John Delancey was the um, male actor that was chosen as the favorite guest and uh, they put us together and, and developed another show called um, Legend. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, with uh, Richard Dean Anderson. Richard Dean Anderson, yeah. We shot that one down in Tucson. Uh, and I learned a very interesting fact that no one knows or mm-hmm. cares about. <laughs> it falls under utterly useless information. Do you know that horse urine freezes? Yes, it does. Oh, yeah. I learned that. Yeah, we were down there, and then we were filming in old Tucson, which I think has since burned, which is a shame. Mm-hmm. It was a period piece, uh, and so I was there in my big old giant Victorian dress, standing next to a horse <laughs> on my mark, waiting for a cue, and the horse would pee, and I watched it as it froze over, so with my own eyes, I saw that happen. And... Uh, uh, it was an interesting show. It was sort of steampunk, old west. Yeah. Um, yeah, the fun show, Bill Dial and Michael Pillar, who um, well, <laughs> Michael Pillar from uh, Star Trek, yeah, produced that one. What was the horse urine stinky? No, it froze. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, it, it was a stinky place. I mean, because we had horses and cattle and stinky critters around. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I don't mind that. I didn't mind that. Uh, and it was fun, you know, it was playing dress up. It was, uh, it, it was playing dress it up in the period clothing and, uh, oh, yeah, those women, it took forever to get dressed, all the layers and layers and layers of the corsets. And then, of course, I had a very contemporary short crop hairdo. And so the wigs, Lots of wigs. So it took a while to get ready for that. But it was fun. It was a lot of fun. You worked with a, a good friend of mine, Diane Franklin, on Fred, Freddy's Nightmares. Ah, uh, Freddy, yeah. Um, I played a character named Red. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was very evil. Very, very evil. Yeah. <laughs> very fun. Um, I was getting married about that time, and uh, we didn't know if it was being picked up again or not, and they dyed my hair red, and I was like, well, do I go back to blonde to get married, or do I stay red, or what do I do? And yeah. <laughs> um, My wedding got moved up rather rapidly, and so I got married with red hair, and... Um, actually kept it red for a long time after that yeah diane she was my first guest and uh at that at that time i was using a dictation recorder to record the interview which is a very bad idea and i lost about the the three minutes that we talked about freddie's nightmares and i feel so bad about that to this day (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> because uh, I was so nervous and overwhelmed that I was talking to Diane Franklin that I forgot to switch the tape over to the other side. I was so upset about that. But Diane's been on eight times overall, and um, she's just a yeah. lovely person. I adore her. She's lovely, yeah. She's really lovely. It was fun working with her. I have to say, one of the greatest blessings of my career is that I have consistently worked mm-hmm. with wonderful people. Um the people of Hollywood sometimes get a bad rap, and those are the ones that get the most press. But the real people of Hollywood, the ones that really do the work, uh, tend to be absolutely lovely. And 
team players. Team players. Because the ones that aren't team players don't last. Well, I always say that. I always say, okay, let's take let's take sexual harassment out of the equation. We know sexual harassment does happen in Hollywood, but let's take that out of the equation. There's two types of people in show business. Wonderful, sweet people who will work forever, whether it's a character actor or a lead star. And then there are fucking assholes who will work forever because money is being made on them, or if there's not money being made, they'll be persona non grata. Um, yeah, they have to be really big to be a jerk. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and the sexual harassment thing, you can't take that out. Well, I mean, in, in, oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, but, but, but that's yeah. That's a very real, I have had to deal with that any number of times, and I know there were parts I didn't get because of that and there were times where things happened so um, you know I, I, I don't, I don't want to get too specific about it yeah that, you don't have to that, um, it's really hard to work for somebody you hate the hell out of right and yet sometimes you have to and uh, that's where you're a pro but unfortunately, that person isn't a pro. And then when they fall from grace, I don't feel bad at all. And um, however, I also think that there are certain individuals who have been accused. Mm -hmm. And then there are, are people, women, who have been, they jump on the bandwagon. And there are people whose good careers have been ruined that don't deserve it. Exactly. You know, there's, there's that yeah. going on. And that has to be acknowledged. But there are those who, uh, I know there are wonderful actresses who have left the business because of that. Right. You never got to see their work because they were chased out by men who are just fuckers. Right. And, uh, you know, that's a societal thing. It's not just Hollywood. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. I got fired from a, a job I had. I had a job for a while from a boss who would come into my office. And uh, I had a real estate. And I, I used my Hollywood money to buy properties. And I worked with a real estate company for a while. And this guy would come in and he put his finger down my boss because he wanted to see what color bra I was wearing. Oh. He didn't want to see my and he would do this, he'd say, oh, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. And uh, I had enough of it, and I grabbed his finger, and I, I, you know, I warned him, I said, I'm going to break your finger, you do that next time. Good but for I, you. Good for you. I got fired. I got fired. And he was coming after me for charges of assault. You know? Yeah. The guy's putting his hand down my blouse, and I'm supposed to put up with that? That what sexual harassment is. Yeah, fuck that. Oh, awful. Yeah, so it's like, no, you don't get to say, oh, put that aside. No, 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 no. That is there. It's like saying, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, you know, it's there. So, yeah, it, it's a big part, and it's something that uh, we have to keep talking about until it's gone. And women aren't the only ones. Yeah, I just don't like the bandwagoners. That's my big problem. It's the bandwagoners that are causing a problem because people are being destroyed that don't deserve that. Exactly. Uh, and, um, you know, it's... it's um, but it's also... You know, it's a shame that... In Hollywood, if you're not... To say powerful meaning if you're a little actor mm -hmm. and you don't have a giant agent and you don't have a big resume and you don't have power uh, you can get abused yeah and uh, you can fall down a flight of stairs and get hurt badly yeah and you stand up and you continue working for a couple of years because you're terrified that if you say, I'm injured, you'll never work again. And that was me. 
Yeah. It's a huge mm. resume. There's a stunt woman. And, yeah. There's a stunt woman named, yeah. Les, named Leslie Hoffman. She um, got injured, I want to say, in 2004. Uh, she had been a stunt woman since the 70s, and she had a pretty big career. The moment she got injured, not only did they say, you're done, they also said, uh, we're not going to pay you for that. She spent 15 years suing them, and she finally won last year and came on this podcast and told me about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and, it, and it's... Um I, I don't want to take on Aaron Spelling. I really don't. Yeah. Um, I will say, to his credit, he hired me for absolutely everything after that. Until, um, you know, it, it's the other thing that happens in Hollywood is uh, ageism. Yeah. Women. And, and at a particular time, it's like, if you are not an established huge star by the time you're 30, forget it. Men have a lot longer. Women don't. Um, Bill Dial uh, and I had a relationship for many years, and he and I had worked together many, many, many times, and uh, we had the same dark sense of humor. And um, <laughs> when he brought back WKRP in Cincinnati, oh, yeah. he wrote a part for me, and I literally stood behind him, and he'd say, well, what would you say in this situation? What would you say in that situation? And, and I would suggest lines, and they were in the script. And, um, um, you know, it was to be my role. And um, when it came time to produce it, they came back and they said, oh, no, 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 she's too old. And they hired Tony Katane. Yeah. It was lovely. It was terrific. Yeah, I knew her. I would suggest she take some acting lessons, but that's yeah. what I would say on that. And, uh, <laughs> You know, Bill had to come home and say, um, that part that we've been working on for months and months and months, mm -hmm. yeah, you're not going to get it. You know, it was not a happy day at our household, I'll tell you that much. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, too old. At 30, 35, a woman isn't sexy. Excuse me? Ugh, yeah. Excuse me? No, at 30, 35, a woman is smart enough to tell an old guy with his hand down your blouse to fuck off. And that's what Hollywood's afraid of. Yeah, it's pretty awful. We're no longer naive enough to put up with the crap that's dealt us. And I don't want to deal with that. Yeah, yeah. it's god-awful. Um, yeah, yeah. So when I left Hollywood... That's what I left, and um, I haven't looked back. Wow. That, you know, one thing I love about doing this podcast is finding stuff like this out, and I've heard it many times. It's just, it's so mind-boggling, you know, the things that can happen behind the scenes, and I've been so lucky to talk to so many strong women like yourself who made it out, because there's some that didn't. Some of them died of drug overdoses, some of them... Yeah. You know, yeah. fell down rabbit holes of other things, you know. It's yeah. Crazy. It's, it, it can get, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that the age where actors uh, are at their most desirable, that young age, you know, where the skin is perfect and you feel yeah. like a dream is when the mind is still developing and the self-esteem is still developing and you don't really know who you are at that age. You think you do, but you don't. Um, and you're very impressionable and it's easy to fall down rabbit holes. And, um, and we end up with these, you know, body image um, problems and um, mm -hmm. drugs, alcohol, anorexia, mm -hmm. all of that comes into it and um, um, a, a story an actress young actress on a, a TV show that I did that was just it was heaven going to work every day was absolute heaven mm -hmm. produced by Earl Hamner it was called Boone by Daniel Boone but Boone yeah starring yeah Thomas Bird and Greg Webb 
uh, whole gang of incredibly talented people, the young actress. What happened with that show? How come it how come it ended so quickly? Because at twenty six percent, we didn't have a big enough rating. Okay. And um, and they brought us back to give us a, a second chance, and they put us up against the Olympics. Uh, and <laughs> people actually watched the Olympics, and, and uh, they said, "See, you didn't get big enough rating." An exquisite show. It's more beautiful than most movies I've seen, and the the, the craftsmanship and the, the performances were beautiful. Absolutely. Quality, 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 quality. It was at, at a time when uh, themes on TV were going away from family oriented and more in, you know, humor was becoming raunchier and mm -hmm. um, humor was becoming, you know, it was considered popular to be a little more risque. And, right. You know, like what was acceptable in the living room was changing. <laughs> and uh, we were appealing very much to the Walton um, type of a viewing audience. Right. And, um, you know, to be kind, loving, family, ethics, morals, show was considered old fashioned. Right. And I think that, that had a lot to do with it, which was really sad because it was an show um, something I'm very proud of very very proud of but oh. the young lady who played my youngest sister uh, Amanda Platt mm -hmm. and I'm not saying anything that's not widely known on the internet as it is mm -hmm. you know she started out as a child actor so talented just so talented mm -hmm. what a beautiful young lady she was and you know she was at that age and then she became more famous and got more jobs and had a lot of public scrutiny and a lot of fans and a lot of pressure put on her to become um, you know a public commodity and uh, you know an actress become a commodity instead of a person yeah. and they develop their public persona and not their soul. And she got lost and got involved in drugs. And yeah. I loved her in um, Can't Buy Me Love. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And that's one of the things that happens when a spotlight is put on a person who isn't mature enough or strong enough to handle it. Yeah. And when, when monetary gains are put ahead of human beings and Hollywood is very guilty of that. Yeah. Do you, do, you have a, do you have a story about working on Spy Hard? My dad took me to see that when I was 13. <laughs> that was so fun. Oh my gosh. Uh, Leslie Nielsen. I love him. I love him. I would work for him any day of the year. I was Agent Moffat. Did he have his um, did he have his fart cushion? Oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and it was just like it, it was constant. It was hmm. constant. And so I was, you know, one of the FBI agents. And hmm. there was one scene where uh, I don't even know if it made it the movie or not. Um, I don't smoke. I I never have. I drank like a fish, but I never smoked. Yeah. And uh um, I don't drink now. Um, and all of the agents we have are, you know, we're in our agent office and we're all doing our agent thing and the smoking and all that. And I've got my feet up on the desk in a mini skirt and high heels smoking a cigar, you know. Yeah. <laughs> doing, doing manly things. Uh, and, and they just pan by it. And it's like, oh my God, I was on that set and... I have never been so sick of the cigar. Oh, I didn't know you're not supposed to inhale. <laughs> but of course I couldn't let them know that I was so sick because I've got to be tough, you know, be one of the guys. Like, man, I'll never do that again. <laughs> that, that 
that was a fun movie to do, and it just what a, what a, you know it was one of those days. It's like I can't believe I'm getting paid to do this. There were a lot of times that I can't believe I'm getting paid to do this. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. He was just one of a kind. It's amazing how he went from being known as a dramatic actor to a comedy later in life. Right, right. That's just the humor. That, well, you know, it's like he's a good-looking guy. There was a while. It's like, you can't be funny unless you're kind of weird-looking. Yeah. And, uh, um, and it was like, that was kind of a later discovery that you could be handsome or attractive and funny yeah um there were exceptions to that uh but you had to have something kind of funny looking about you to be uh funny um when i met my agent for example mm. you know i was a pretty little high school girl slender and blonde and you know i looked like every other blonde high school kid yeah. and uh but i was attractive i suppose and um I said to you earlier in our interview that I was the only one who knew how to make the dress fit, and that's why I was in the play when the, the agent came. Yeah. And uh, the gal who was supposed to play that character was quite a round, curvaceous, full-figured girl. Mm -hmm. Well, it was the night before. I didn't have time to take the dress in, so I padded myself out, and I put the shoes on the opposite feet so mm -hmm. that I would have kind of a gangly gait, and I... I made myself full figured, which was acceptable to be funny and full figured. And um, so I went out there and I did it. And then when uh, he contacted me through the school and I went into his office to meet him, well, now I look like myself, a little blonde and a little slim dress. And mm -hmm. I'm sitting in his office and I hear him saying, where's that Kitty Ruth girl? Where is she? And uh, his assistant say, well, what's she look like? Well, she's got bright red hair and she's full figured and funny. She's funny looking. I'm just not here. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I got up and I said, I'm Kitty Ruth. And he looked at me and the disappointment on his face was like, oh shit, another pretty blonde. Like, what doesn't already have nine million of those. We need an interesting character, funny girl, not a meh. And uh, he was very disappointed um, to discover, but you know, mm -hmm. turned out I could be funny, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? And Les Nielsen, I mean, what? I mean, he could read the phone book and be funny. Oh, yeah. He, I mean, he could. He, when he was the captain in the Poseidon Adventure, which is a uh, which is a uh, you know a drama, you know he was funny in that when he called the guy a responsible bastard. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. A poopsie don. Yeah. That's what they called it the Poseidon, the poopsie don. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how's how's yeah. how's how's the jewelry business been during COVID? time to mm. kind of explore and make different things. Um, for me, creativity, making things, being an artist is uh, kind of my meditation, my serenity. And uh, I do a lot of one-of-a-kind jewelry for uh, uh, a lot of private clients and I work with stylists who buy jewelry for their clients, so a lot of my clients I don't even meet, and uh, I'm broadening my horizons, and, um, you know, I do take private clients, I do still take new clients, um, I have a little website that's just a little slideshow, and it's katherinemoffettdesigns.com, and um, I don't sell on the internet, I only show, mm -hmm. and then people can contact me, and I work pretty much with who I want. <laughs> that sounds really snotty, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, no, no. It's, uh, it's, it sounds very determined. Well, I am about keeping my life balanced. Um, I do have a disability. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not able to work at all in a capacity that one would need to in order to run a business. Yeah. And... Um, um, I do 
a lot of uh, volunteer work in other areas, and that keeps me happy. And, um, but the creativity is just, uh, you know, I made my first jewelry out of, you know, as a kid out of toilet paper rolls. I made bangle bracelets and covered them in pipe cleaners. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, this, is, this is my natural setting. Hmm. And um, for a while, I did had a little clothing line that I did while I was acting on, you know, when I wasn't working. I, I'm a total workaholic. I always want to be busy, and so I mm-hmm. created clothing for some very nice uh, galleries and boutiques in Beverly Hills using antique kimonos and uh, interesting antique textiles from around the world. Um, and so there's actually you know, some work out there that's kind of cool, and eventually I'd like to go back to that, and, you know, as my health is increasing, and, you know, I'm in my PT, and I'm swimming in the pool, and, I'm, you know, that's a full-time job. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to, you know, I'm going to have to have help, but, uh, you know, just because my body has some physical challenges doesn't mean I'm incapable. It just means I have to go about doing things in a different way. So uh, it means I need help. And uh, so I, you know, I can't do everything all by myself anymore. But, uh, you know, uh, I don't think of myself as disabled. I think of myself as differently abled. Yes. And, uh, you know, like I don't walk with a limp. I have a designer walk. <laughs> um, I consider myself incredibly lucky that I'm able to walk, and um, I still sing. You know, I don't sing professionally. I get paid in donuts these days. I sing for a church, <laughs> and that keeps me happy. And so it's like a disability doesn't have to be the end of your life. Right. I mean, you know that. You're doing these podcasts. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't make much money, that's for sure. I would like to be able to make more money, but... Uh, Trust me, jewelry is an expensive hobby, but that's the way it has to be right now. And uh, um, so, you are I'm so very blessed. Yeah. yeah, you are so positive. I I love hearing your outlook on life, Catherine. I really do. Well, I tell you what, none of us are getting out of life alive anyway, so we yeah. may as well enjoy it while we're here, right? Right. And. Um, I'm still on the right side of the daisies, and I'm going to work very hard to stay that way. And uh, I really love life. I I am blessed. I have had absolutely amazing experiences that uh, most people don't ever even dare dream to do. Um, I was a beauty pageant winner, and I traveled all over the world. I learned to fly an airplane. I... Uh, got married in Rome. I, uh, you know, I've had all kinds of things. I've owned my own home. I, uh, you know, I, I, I just could not ask for more. I could not ask for more. I've been uh, pronounced dead once. That was fun. Really? Um, How? I can say that. <laughs> or certainly not say it twice. And, uh, and here I am. Mm. So, uh, life is really good. And, um, you know, the positive attitude that you talk about, it's a choice, Mm -hmm. it's a job, it does not come naturally, Um, and it's something I have to work at, but it's an important decision that has to be made on a daily basis. Beautiful, beautiful. So I always like to end Catherine with a joke. A joke? Yep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> What's the joke? What do you call do you want... a, a what? Oh, okay. Go. Oh. What do you call a boy that doesn't masturbate? Hungry. A liar. <laughs> <laughs> Way with that. 
while everyone's always guessing the punchline, they always say, you know, um, a girl, a liar, or, or no, a girl, a loser, different, you know, punchlines. <laughs> I think I, I think a few people have said it actually. Because if you can't bait your hook, you don't catch the fish, and then you're hungry. Exactly. <laughs> there you go. There you go. What about a knock knock joke? You start. Okay, knock knock. Who's there? What? I wait a second. You want me to tell a knock knock joke? You're saying? <laughs> I'm not good at knock knock jokes, because because they're mostly cheesy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's now I, I I I unfortunately most of the jokes I know are filthy and, and certainly not appropriate. Oh, I and, I, I uh, tell filth I tell filthy I filthy jokes all the time on here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. You know the. Di- it has sure been a pleasure talking with you, and uh, I wish you all the very very best. Uh, yeah. Kath- Catherine, you are just an exceptional, wonderful lady, and I'm glad that you're oh, li- you're living out, you know, your your years to the fullest. And I I just I just think you're amazing. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing these great and sometimes you know uplifting stories. Yeah, keep trudging. Just keep trudging. Um, the sun's gonna come up anyway. It's it's true, you know. I I used to be afraid to try things, um, but now that now that you know, I'm not afraid to try things. You know, I'm glad I do it, even if I fail at it. Yeah, I've failed at some pretty humongous things in big ways, but I don't regret it at all, at all. Okay, uh, okay. Here's here's one. Okay, here's one more joke. You know the difference between okay. you know the difference between a golf ball and a G spot. A man rather spend twenty minutes looking for a golf ball. <laughs> that is so true. <laughs> <laughs> ah, thanks for the reminder. I. <laughs> <laughs> I think I woke. Right. I, I think I woke in the Jewish in you. <laughs> oh, oi, oi, yeah. Well, there is somewhere back there. So you got it. <laughs> Catherine, right. have a great day and be safe out there. Okay, be well. Be well. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, there you have it. Catherine Moffat, H.E.A. sweetheart. Oh, my God. What an amazing lady. And great sense of humor there, don't you think? Yeah, God. Survi- She's a survivor, you know? There's so many survivors out there of Hollywood and the bullshit that comes with it, you know? with sexual harassment and ageism and all that crap. God, she's terrific. I didn't expect the interview to get that deep, but I'm glad it did. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.